welcome to this class on uh, neuroscience of human movement course. So, this is on uh, persistent inward currents and EMG as part of the motor units topic. So, we have been seeing motor units. So, what is a motor unit? A motor unit is basically a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers associated with that and uh, we said the higher the input to this motor unit, the motor neuron, the higher the input it receives, the higher is going to be the force. Actually, it turns out that it is a linear relationship. In what condition we mentioned that, uh, that there is a joker in the pack, there are other things in the consider in that needs to be taken into consideration and we said that that is persistent inward current. So, in this class we will talk about the importance of uh, persistent inward currents and uh, EMG the difference between uh, needle and uh, surface electrodes in EMG how to process uh, EMG and how to normalize EMG data and uh, some details and discussion of uh, example data. We said yesterday that uh, motor unit discharge rate and input currents. So, we said that uh, there is a synaptic current that is uh, depolarizing that is attempting to depolarize the motor neurons. We use this picture actually for size principle, illustration of size principle. We will continue with the same picture, it does not really matter. So, suppose a synaptic current is uh, attempting to depolarize two motor neurons. It turns out that as the current increases, the discharge rate of this motor neuron also increases. So, in other words, and, and actually that is a nearly linear relationship as I keep increasing not only as, as I keep increasing the current not only does the discharge rate increase, it is also linear over a relatively wide range. So, it is also approximately linear over a relatively wide range, but when, when is this true? This is true in the absence of any other inputs. If the synaptic current is the only input under consideration, then this relationship is approximately uh, linear over a wide range, but it turns out that there are other things. Suppose there is a dendrite on this uh, motor neuron, we will call this dendrite and uh, this dendrite has a special channel, I am going to call this channel as L type calcium channel. This channel is uh, capable of uh, firing in response to the presence of monoamines. What are these monoamines? These monoamines under discussion are serotonin and nor epinephrine. epinephrine okay. These monoamines come from the brain stem. So, these mono means when they are present on this when they when they arrive and uh, influence the L type calcium channel are these calcium channels open causing a large influx of calcium causing an inward current what we said long time ago in one of the early classes that an inward current is the influx of cations into the cell or the outflux of anions. So, calcium is a, ca is a cation and this invert current causes a firing that is known to sustain for relatively long periods. This firing is called as self sustained firing and this invert current is called as persistent invert current. Persistent invert current is this response of these motor neurons to the presence to the arrival to the in influence of monoamine serotonin and norepinephrine through L type calcium channels. So, these L type calcium channels allow a large influx of calcium and causing a relatively large inward current. So, and this inward current is large enough to let the firing continue or sustain 
even after an input is received, even after an input is removed. So, this synaptic current alone produces some output. If mono ohmins are present, the output due to this synaptic current is going to be greater. So, in a way what this does, what this uh, monominergic input, this monominergic input comes from the brain stem. So, what this monominergic input from the brain, brain stem does is to provide some sort of a tuner. So, I am able to control the gain of uh, the firing. So, this is linear over a relatively wide range when there is no monominergic input, but in the presence of monominergic input the response of the system or the discharge rate for a given for the same uh, input current the response becomes non-linear. So, so earlier what was uh, simple and straightforward now has been uh, complicated by the presence of this uh, monominergic input. So, this what, what, what would be the purpose of uh, such a process? Um, consider a situation when for example, I am just standing, I am standing and maintaining posture. For this purpose what you need is relatively sustained firing of motor neurons and sustained contractions in the muscle for relatively long period. For example, this class may last up to 40 minutes or 50 minutes. I am going to be standing for about 40 to 50 minutes. So, uh, that is a relatively long period in neuronal terms. We are talking about uh, you know a uh, very long period in neuronal terms. So, we need to keep the force sustained for a relatively long period and we said what type of motor neurons are suitable for this, what type of motor units are suitable for this? The slow motor units, the small motor units are suitable to produce sustained low force levels for relatively long periods of time, is it not? These are, uh, these can be activated by these monomins and to, to keep the postural uh, system produce uh, a sustained amount of force for a relatively long period of time. Okay. So, this is uh, one, this could be one purpose of uh, the persistent inward currents. So, we said that the monominergic input comes from the brain stem and uh, posture maintenance is due to sustained monominergic. This is believed again you know that is the reason I have put a question mark here. One way in which I could maintain posture is by sustaining a monominergic input to slow motor units. This is believed to be the probable uh, method mechanism by which posture is maintained. And then what happens during sleep? Suppose you go to sleep, uh, what you see is that you know these posture maintenance mechanisms are withdrawn. So, this monominergic input to the posture maintaining uh, muscles is withdrawn temporarily until you wake up from sleep, right. So, during sleep there is a temporary switching off of this uh, uh, of this uh, persistent inward currents of the monominergic system. So, that you know the person can uh, sleep in relaxed you know with relaxed muscles, relaxed body is it not. A question is does this mean that I can override size principle? I said that by increasing uh, in the earlier slide I said by having uh, the L type calcium channels and uh, monominergic input and the invert current I could increase the force for a given uh, synaptic current. Does that mean that I could override uh, the size principle? In other words can a small motor unit produce uh, can a larger motor unit be recruited first and a smaller motor unit recruited later? Is that a possibility? That is the question. The answer is no, why not? Because it turns out that I, it turns out that uh, even with monoaminergic input, it is the slower motor units, it is the smaller motor units that are getting recruited first and then the larger motor units and then the faster motor units. So, so this means that size principle continues to be a relatively universal principle. Uh, that guides uh, this uh, process more than uh, yes. So, and so that means monominergic inputs are only uh, a tuning uh, knob where I can change the gain of the system. I can change the gain or specifically more specifically I can change the excitability of the motor neuronal pool. So, the greater the monominergic input the more is the probability that a given motor neuronal pool is going to go to depolarization or 
the easier it is going to be for me to take a particular neuron in that motor neuronal pool to depolarization to threshold and to action potential. Let us remember note I am talking about taking the motor units to depolarization and action threshold and action potential. Note every time this motor neuron is firing the fiber does not have the choice of not firing. Here I am talking about whether a motor neuron can fire or not. So, the motor neuron has the choice or the motor neuron can produce greater potentials and action potentials whereas, every time there is an action potential in a motor neuron the muscle fiber must fire we said that that, that relationship is obligatory. Here I am not talking about muscle fiber, but rather about the motor neuron I am talking about the neuron. Okay. So, we cannot override the size principle let us also remember that the size principle is actually a coordinative rule and not a prescribing rule I, we said that earlier. Suppose there were like 5 or 6 uh, motor units of the same size and I need only one of them to be recruited the system does not choose which exact one to be uh, recruited. So, it is not a prescribing rule size principle does not choose which one of the 5 because all of them are equal in size right which one of the 5 do I rec uh, recruit that prescription does not come from size principle, but rather a coordinative rule. In comparison with the larger motor units motor units of this size are preferred at this point in time. So, it is a coordinative rule in that sense ok. This is one effect of monominergic uh, input. So, what would happen illustration um, suppose let us take a case of uh, let us take a few cases let us take a couple of cases when the monominergic input is uh, relatively uh, small and the monominergic input is uh, relatively large and see what would be the difference uh, that would be observed ok. Let us uh, I am going to draw the slow ones the slow case first with red color ok. So, suppose uh, suppose there is ok we will start with the we will start with the normal case when there is no monominergic input there is no monominergic input ok the response is like that this is the current and uh, and then a monominergic input of relatively small amplitude is uh, present say for example ok. So, some monominergic input is present ok something is present and it is withdrawn. By the way how do I take the system back to the original case inhibitory uh, mechanisms come into the picture to take the system back to the original resting uh, uh, state ok. So, suppose the mo the input is withdrawn ok then what this does is that a sustained tail current is produced for a relatively long period of time it does not go back to 0 Im immediately it takes a relatively long time we said persistent inward current right this is the persistence part of the persistent inward current even after removal of the monominergic input the current. So, he, here monominergic input is withdrawn here it is introduced even after the monominergic input is withdrawn the current does not go back to 0, but rather sustains at a at some value right. Suppose and what, what happens to the firing rate what happens to the firing rate he, here there was no firing I am going to draw that in black initially when there was no uh, input there was no firing it was like this. And in the presence of monominergic input just after the monominergic input comes that is you know sustained firing and this continues. So, here is when here is the time when the monominergic input is withdrawn, but the cell the discharge rate of the cell does not go back to 0 immediately after the uh, input is withdrawn this continues for some time. We said that this is you know persistent inward uh, current this is the persistent part or we call this as the sustained firing is it not. So, this is the sustenance part of the sustained firing suppose I ha I gave a greater input uh, the current is greater or uh, the monominergic input is greater suppose it is like this uh, I am using a darker blue I will use a different blue 
okay. Suppose the input is so much, I am giving at approximately the same time a different input and I am removing at approximately the same time a relatively larger input. Right. Then what this does also, this also produces a tail current that is going to continue for a relatively long period and the response again I am drawing it here in the bottom below this line and the response continues or maybe with a higher frequency and again sustains for a relatively long period even after the removal. The removal is happening at this point, but uh, even after the removal of the monominogenic input the output the discharge rate continues at an elevated level. So, once again, uh, so if I want to keep, if I want to you know uh, make the system respond to a relatively small uh, current and keep it sustained for a relatively long period of time, that is going to be possible by tuning this uh, monominogenic input. If I keep the monominogenic uh, input relatively high, this is going to continue for a relatively long period of time. Okay. And other other things. So suppose I was uh, suppose we were uh, what what this means is that the force levels. How would the response be for the force levels under consideration? Suppose I am doing I am using the the small uh, monominogenic input. Suppose that was the the level that was there developed. That was the force level that was developed for the same conditions with a higher input the force is force developed is going to look like this meaning that you know I am going to be able to develop a relatively large amount of uh, force in a relatively smaller period of time with the monominogenic input. So, this means we could this has profound very deep influence on how force can be controlled how uh, firing rate of motor neurons can be controlled. So, the relationships between synaptic current and discharge rate, synaptic current and recruitment that we saw earlier using um, size principle and rate coding is taken for a task is taken for a uh, taken to a one level uh, one notch higher because of uh, this influence because of the influence of brain stem in controlling this. So, the brain stem is responsible for controlling this monominergic input. What are these monomines? Serotonin and norepinephrine is it not. So, um, with this, uh, th this topic is uh, relatively broad and relatively deep there is not sufficient time to discuss this. So, those who are interested can go through the work of Professor C. J. Heckman of Northwestern University US. Okay. Professor C. J. Heckman there is a very nice review paper where he talks about uh, uh, the role of persistent invert currents and how they uh, originate, what are the various things this could do. By the way, these are data, these are actually representations of uh, real data from uh, cat, from these are animal data, real data. So, it is not uh, you know simulations or this, this is actually observed experimental data from uh, the cat's uh, leg muscles I suppose. So, those who are interested can go through the work of uh, Professor C J. Okay. So, with this we finish the topic of uh, persistent invert current and we move on to the next topic which is uh, electromyography or electromyogram. What happens when there are when a motor uh, neuron fires, when a motor neuron is activated, when it produces an action potential, it causes uh, action potential in all the muscle fibers innervated by it at approximately the same time. So, this may be about 50 or 5 or 10 or different number of uh, muscle fibers may be innervated by this motor neuron. So, all the fibers go to threshold at approximately the same time causing a local field potential. This local field potential is sometimes actually in in large muscles large and superficial muscles superficial means those that are closer to the surface of the skin right large superficial muscles this local field potential is observable using electrodes that are placed on the skin so i can place electrodes on top of the skin and measure this local field potentials okay so when i place these electrodes on the surface of the skin 
we and measure the muscle activity what we are doing is a method called surface EMG also called as interferential EMG. So, this is surface EMG uh, or another method uh, that is used is uh, suppose I am interested not in observing activities of multiple motor units, but rather I am interested in observing the fine activity of just a few motor units or even one motor unit at a time. Is it possible for me to do that? Technology is available to do this. So, what we do is we insert a needle. So, whenever we say that we insert a needle, we are talking about an invasive procedure. So, we are actually taking a person or an animal and inserting something into the body, is it not? So, we insert a needle into the, into the muscle of interest and this needle contains a very fine wire that is electrically isolated from it. So, inside the needle there is a wire that is passing through and that wire is isolated electrically from its uh, uh, from the needle itself. And when it is placed inside at the tip of the wire, the tip of the wire alone is not isolated. So, the difference in potential between the needle and the tip of the wire is measured as a potential difference through the regular uh, measurement techniques right and this can represent activity of a few 4 5 or sometimes as much as 10 but preferably a smaller number of motor units giving fine uh, information that is not observable from surface emg so this method is uh, called as needle emg are also called as fine wire emg so, I am going to call this as surface EMG and needle EMG for the rest of the class. Okay. This is needle EMG, okay. this is also called as fine wire EMG, there are details that vary, there are several variants that have different names and uh, the details uh, vary, but we will call this as surface EMG and needle EMG. A question is how do we measure surface EMG, how do you know, several questions arise, how do you know where to place the electrode. Um, the answer is uh, you usually know what muscle is responsible for a particular uh, you know mechanical action. So, when I, when I am performing a particular action you already know what muscle is responsible for that you should know and you know the approximate location of this uh, muscle on the person's body approximate location. You can place the electrode on what is called as the muscle belly. So, you want to place the electrode on the muscle belly what do I mean by muscle belly? Muscle belly is that part of the muscle that uh, that is lying between two tendons basically a muscle attaches uh, muscle is attached between two bones through tendons is it not that part of the muscle that is not a tendon that is not attached to the tendon is the belly. So, suppose I have a tendon like that and I have a muscle like that and the other tendon is here this is belly. It is not clear where the muscle belly is located for different muscles in different people. So, sometimes it requires some amount of trial and error you need to keep moving the electrode while performing the same action you need to keep moving the electrode to different points in the body wherever you are getting the maximum amplitude of uh, or the maximum response that is the point where you want to keep the electrode usually this is one method in which uh, this is done there are other experimental uh, approaches that come into this picture. So, we want to place the electrode in the muscle belly and so what is the goal? The goal is to measure the ensemble activity of a whole number of motor units. So, this may be 100 motor units, this may be several tens of motor units. So, what you are measuring in some sense is uh, a gross uh, you know measurement. So, you are getting a gross idea of what the muscle itself is trying to do what the not what the motor unit is trying to do you are getting an idea of. Uh, so, this is gross or uh, a representation of the muscle activity whereas, the needle electrode again you need to place it within the muscle belly of course, not on the tendon this represents fine measurements okay, that may be due to a few motor units. Okay. So, now 
what else is there? So, there are, we said that there is needle, this needle uh, EMG is also called as intra, intra means within muscular. So, within the same muscle uh, if the EMG is measured that is called intramuscular or needle EMG or surface or interferential EMG. Okay. So, here there is an example of uh, how the needles are placed. Let us agree that you know uh, this is an invasive procedure. So, that means there is an amount of discomfort associated with this procedure. It is not free, it is not like painless. Uh, as much as the experimenters will try to tell you oh this our procedure is absolutely harmless, will not you know uh, torture you or whatever. Uh, it turns out that you know these procedures are a little uh, okay, relatively uh, uncomfortable, actually somewhat painful from time to time depending on uh, the expertise of the person, depending on how well uh, who, who is doing the part. If the person is a novice, the chances are you, you are going to feel a relatively large amount of uh, pain. So, there, there, there exists some amount of discomfort in this procedure, but uh, why do that then? Uh, there are reasons why you would want to do that, we will discuss that in the future slides. So, also that means ethical considerations come into the picture. The moment you are uh, saying you want to put something inside a person's body, the ethics committee is up in arms. You want to because you see there is a local ethics committee in every institute, we have a uh, IIT Madras uh, institutional ethics committee. So, suppose I am saying I want to measure uh, you know needle EMG for a particular reason, immediately the ethics committee wants to know what is the big scientific achievement that you are going to make by putting people through such pain. And th there is some validity in that question, right? Because you you cannot uh, just put people through pain and get nothing out of it. There must be some justification for the discomfort faced by the subjects. There must be some reasonable scientific justification for that, of course. And of course, you cannot keep pushing that that uh, justification too far. There must be, I mean, that must be really reasonable. So there are like 10, 15 people who sit and check whether what you are doing is actually worth your while. Uh, in terms of doing this. So, uh, let us not get into that topic. So, there are ethical considerations when it comes to needle uh, EMG. Where is this more frequently used? We need to check that. So, what there are these two differences one is surface, the other is uh, needle. What are the major differences? I said that uh, major differences is that fairly large number of group of muscle fibers, not uh, muscles, fairly large uh, group of muscle fibers, okay, measures activity of a a specific group of fibers are within a single muscle and in general it is believed that if you would like to measure something, you do not want to have the measuring method to interfere with the, the process that is being measured is it not. I am interested in understanding how movement happens, I do not want to you know do something that will affect the way in which the movement itself happens. So, in that sense surface electrodes are more suitable because they do not interfere so much uh, or they interfere less the right way of saying this is they interfere less with the natural uh, body movements when compared with uh, needle electrodes. Uh, needle electrodes cause sufficient pain to consider that they cause substantial interference with how you would naturally uh, otherwise naturally behave. Usually, there is a relationship between uh, how much uh, activity you are measuring the mean amplitude of the EMG and what is the force that is generated by that muscle right or at constant or at uh, either at constant length isometric or at constant velocity. So, the force is usually proportional to the EMG. So, the greater the EMG the greater is the force that is going to be measured. Whereas, here you are talking about single or a few motor units. So, this does not constitute the muscle itself okay. and you cannot uh, measure forces of individual motor units. You can measure forces produced by individual muscles, but not by individual motor uh, units not in a live person, not in a live individual, not in a the not in humans not so easy to do that. The disadvantage is that what you are measuring is uh, you cannot me measure what is going on deep inside the skin. So, you are restricted to be me to measuring superficial and large muscles in the case of uh, surface EMG. So, you cannot do deep uh, 
analysis of uh, deep muscles that is not possible because what happens is that the muscle itself is deep above that there are other muscles above that there are uh, above that there is uh, fat and above that there is uh, several layers of skin above all that you are placing the electrode above, above the skin you have uh, hair and uh, on top of that you are placing the electrode. So, by the time the signal reaches it is sufficiently attenuated that you get no specific uh, you know input that concerns the that that relates the force with the actual electrical activity what you are measuring is going to be nothing not, not very useful for the deep muscles. So, surface uh, EMG has that big disadvantage and uh, needle EMG can be used for deep uh, muscles I can uh, you know insert this deeply that is the whole purpose of having a deep uh, uh, the whole purpose of having needle EMG. So, I could do that however, uh, the problem is it comes with uh, the cost there is a there is some discomfort or pain associated with that and it turns out that the major uh, use surface EMG is more frequently used in research in labs labs like mine where we perform experiments on uh, specific human movements. So, and it is easier to get approval from ethics committee for surface EMG you just have to uh, like like it is a non invasive procedure you just have to convince the committee that it is a non invasive procedure and you are going to ensure that the person is not going to get any form of shock. Once they are convinced that your, your system is not going to shock the individual your the chances are very high that your, your uh, proposal for study research study is going to be approved by the ethics committee. Whereas, uh, the same research if I want to perform with needle EMG chances are relatively low because it is an invasive procedure. So, then what is the use of having this it turns out that this is more frequently used in the clinic. We are interested in studying conduction velocities of say in health and disease. So, for example, diabetes causes uh, you know neuropathy this causes uh, a profound change in the conduction velocity of uh, the system. How does that uh, affect how, how is that to be measured? right so in such cases needle electrodes is the modality of choice for us so this is more frequently used in the clinic when compared with uh, you know surface emg surface emg is used more frequently in the lab whereas needle emg more frequently in the clinic okay so how do you process these signals first involves filtering so it turns out that uh, the dominant power in the emg signals is between 20 hertz and about 500 hertz there are some muscles it seems there are some muscles in which uh, the dominant um, frequencies can be up to 1000 hertz, but usually this is between 20 hertz and 500 hertz. So, you want to filter between 20 hertz and uh, 500 hertz and you want to rectify this it turns out that because I am placing two electrodes suppose there is a suppose that is the skin surface I am placing one electrode here and I am placing another electrode here. The wave of depolarization is going in that direction what you are measuring is the potential difference that is measured with, with some amplification right with some amplification that is what I am measuring say one of them is uh, considered plus and minus if the wave of depolarization is traveling in that direction versus the wave of depolarization traveling in that direction the polarity of the signal is going to change. So, uh, EMG is uh, has components below 0 because of this reason. So, it has both positive and negative components. So, you, you need to you know rectify this then that takes us to the regular electrical uh, engineering uh, question whether do you want to perform full wave rectification or whether do you want to perform half wave rectification. Usually for we perform full wave rectification in this case. So, that what that means is that all the negative components will be so it is like taking absolute of a of a number. So, in MATLAB you would do that absolute of a number may basically what that does all the negative numbers are made into positives whereas half wave rectification they, they make them into zeros that is the difference in terms of algorithmic uh, approach in terms of algorithm this is how you would do that. And then what you do you integrate them or perform a moving average uh, window after that to find out how the movement itself is related right you integrate it at a you integrate it and then low pass filter it or perform an envelope detection type of uh, uh, analysis to find out how movement itself is related to EMG 
there is an example. So, we have discussed these things almost all of these and there is an example we will discuss in the future slides. So, one particular problem is that different people produce the same force with different levels of EMG. So, a given voltage does not necessarily given EMG amplitude does not necessarily tell you what the force produced by that muscle is. So, you cannot uh, there, there is absolutely no predictability with that. So, because of that reason usually it is required for you to normalize the EMG signals in some sense. So, with uh, so what is usually done is that you find EMG the measured EMG and you compare it with a standard task ok. This is usually uh, what is called as a maximum voluntary contraction task or the, or the maximum force that the person is trying to produce what is the EMG at that time in comparison with that EMG what is the EMG produced during a particular task. So, this is one way in which you could standardize or normalize this. This then will be compare very well relatively well to the force and then I can take it uh, I can come I can compare this across individuals. This uh, gives me a chance to compare them across different people. So, here is an example suppose this is a raw data that is produced and uh, after some filtration you get this and I rectify this. So, this part is now missing here and the amplitude of the that is increased and then I smoothen them. So, I low pass filter it at uh, relatively uh, low frequencies and then uh, either I integrate them or I take a root mean square or I take a moving average window or something of that sort to produce this. And if I compare so importantly usually what is done is movements are also movements are kinematics is measured along with the, the um, EMG. So, suppose that was the displacement ok there is some displacement is there and that displacement. So, suppose that is a displacement and there is some displacement here and then there is one more displacement there. So, what usually compared is the timing uh, or the onset of the displacement versus the onset of the EMG usually there will be some differences these differences reflect uh, in some sense health or disease and so on and so forth. So, usually we are interested in latencies uh, and uh, how the amplitude of the displacements or the forces you could either have displacements or you could measure forces. So, this could be a force curve also the amplitude of the forces how do they relate to the amplitude of the EMG itself or integrated EMG itself and the latencies between the force change in force versus the change in the uh, EMG these are the things that are uh, of interest for us. So, we have seen in summary we have seen peak persistent invert current and monoaminergic input in relatively great detail and we have seen surface EMG needle EMG the differences between surface EMG and uh, needle EMG and we have seen uh, how to process uh, EMG signal. So, what are the steps filtering rectification and then integration. By the way that order is important uh, you cannot for example, exchange integration and rectification because obviously if you, if you integrate uh, a signal that is looking like this right you are going to get a relatively small value. So, you cannot exchange in uh, these two steps rectification and integration always integration must follow recti rectification obviously and uh, normalization of EMG how is EMG normalized compared with a standard task or a maximum voluntary contraction task. So, with this we come to the end of this class uh, what next what lies ahead for us um, the next topics are receptors with particular with particular reference to proprioceptors and some discussion of other receptors cutaneous receptors. So, proprioceptors means muscle spindle. So, proprioceptors those that give you a sense of where you are right muscle spindles ok muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs ok these will be discussed in future classes. So, thank you very much for your attention.